And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing David S. Cohen with Cohen Law Firm. It's www.cohenlawfirmplc.com. David Cohen is the owner of Cohen Law Firm, specializing in helping dentists and specialists with their legal business transactional needs, including practice pur purchases, sales, partnerships, associates, and business structuring and formation. He speaks extensively to dental audiences across the country on these topics. Cohen Law Firm serves clients nationally and understands the unique nature of the laws that relates to dentistry. Um, my my um, interest. Well, there's so many questions I could ask you. I hope I hope you got. Do you, do you block up a whole hour for me? Absolutely. Um, God, there's so many questions. I mean, there's the, the the kids that come out of dental school and they don't even go look at practices because they think I got three hundred fifty thousand dollars student loans. No one's going to lie with me a dime. Um, then you got all these old guys who think they're going to sell their office for a million dollars and live off that for retirement. Then when they go to sell it, they find out that uh, that pie in the sky. And uh, what, what, what is your typical bread and butter case? I mean, who, who's calling you mostly for what? I, I mean, I do root canals, fillings, crowns. What are you mostly doing? What I'm mostly doing is practice transitions. I'm helping doctors buy and sell practices and partner together, drafting the contracts or reviewing the contracts in connection with the transactions. Okay, a lot of dentists are confused because way back in the day, um, when I got out of school, the, the biggest practice broker transition deal was uh, um, Alan F. Thornburg, and his company was AFCO, and he rep he recommended dual representation. And then a lot of people on the message board said, well, if they're representing the buyer and the seller, who, who are they representing? So when you said you uh, help people buy and sell practices, are you representing buyers and sellers, or do you, or do you recommend just re recommend... Uh, representing the buyer or the seller? My recommendation is to represent the buyer or the seller. I don't do dual representations. On very limited circumstances, I will do a dual representation when it's say, you know, a father-son transaction. They'll have to sign a waiver uh, of, of a conflict of interest, but it is a conflict of interest that needs to be disclosed. And I, it's, a, it's very rare that I do that. I do represent one side in a transaction, whether it's the buyer or the seller. Yeah, I'm trying to get Ryan to buy my car for four hundred thousand dollars. He won't pay. <laughs> Ryan, it's worth it. It's worth it. Um, so, so, um, so, are you mostly representing old guys like me selling their practice, or young kids coming out of school buying one? I'm representing both, and I'm also representing um, a lot of experienced doctors that own practices that are going to acquire additional locations. Uh, that may buy other practices to add to what they have. So um, really uh, a diverse array of doctors. Now, when you say add to what they have, you mean a merger and acquisition where the old man across the street is going to retire and instead of sell, and instead of letting some you know 30-year-old high-energy kid come in and buy it and crush it for 30 years, you just buy the practice, roll the charts into your office, a typical merger and acquisition? Or are you talking about dentists who say, well, I'm on the south side of town. I'll have better scales of economy if I had one on the north, the east, and west, and then have a, a kind of a layer of management. What, what, which so a little bit of both. You know, some doctors decide, hey, I'm just going to buy the records from across the street, bring them over to my office. I just finished a transaction today doing exactly that. Uh, other doctors decide that they want to expand what they're doing, and they want to bring in partners and have other practice locations, you know, identify other locations across town or in other places in the state where they may have another location to um, have more production and uh, bring in associates to own those practices. When you Almost like a miniature DSO model for the own, you know, that the, the doctors can have um, for themselves. When you, um, are doing these deals where they're buying the charts and rolling them into an existing. I mean, because M&A activity is huge on Wall Street. And I have always thought our little cottage industry needs to follow Wall Street. And uh, it's just, and every time I meet a dentist, I mean, every time, if they're in the, at the three to four million mark, what they've done is when every old guy within five miles of their practice has retired over the last 40 years, they, they bought the practice, rolled in the charts. But I want to put that in perspective. When these guys buy those charts and roll in, what is the average price of their paying per chart? 
because they can look at their own marketing and say, well, with Google ads and Facebook ads and direct mail and yellow pages and billboards, they might be paying $150 a new patient, you know, for an acquisition cost. It's tough for me to say the average price that a chart is being bought for because it can be, you know, it can vary. And in fact, I just had a transaction that finished today where it was pretty rare, where there actually, it wasn't a price per chart. It was actually a flat fixed purchase price. I typically recommend paying per chart because that's really what you're buying. And you're, you're buying the, the fact that these patients are going to come over to your office. And if they don't, then it's really not worth anything to you. So I do recommend the model where you perhaps put down some money up front as good faith. And then because obviously the buyer has some culpability and accountability as well to ensure that those patients do come to their office and they're treated well. But it's a huge, uh, you know, accountab accountability factor as well for the seller to ensure that they transfer the goodwill and get those patients over to the other office. You know, I typically see, um, I would say, you know, maybe a hundred dollars per chart, um, but it, it can really, I, it's hard for me to say an average because it can vary significantly based upon the specialty and based upon. Um, the circumstances that they're dealing with the seller. Well, you know, uh, you know, everything in business is supply and demand, and I can't tell you how insane it is when you go into these small towns and it's they've got a, uh, you know, ten thousand people, they've got ten dentists, and the old man's retiring. If the other nine buys it, now you've gone from ten offices to nine, and when you sell. I mean, I look at the energy I had. I got out of dental school at 24. My God, I was bouncing off the walls for 10 years. I mean, I worked 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday and wasn't tired. I mean, I mean, we. I mean, sometimes we'd get ready to leave at seven, and a toothache could walk in, and I'd do a root canal billet and crown from seven to 9:30. Nobody 50 or 60 years old is going to do that. Why? Uh, so M&A activity. I mean, you, um, you. In fact, uh, you should write an article for Dental Town sometime uh, explaining the in the um, advantages of M&A activity. I mean, uh, and I want to ask you another question. Um, when you're putting partners together, uh, not not to dish you or disrespect you, but it seems like people who are making money putting together partnerships talk about them like they're great. But the bottom line is, you know, marriage, when you get married, you have sex, children, holidays, and that fails half the time. Why would anybody want to marry a male dentist that they don't have sex with or have children with? I mean, isn't that just a bad <laughs> idea right out of the gate? Well, I, I don't. I think it's a bad idea for some people, and I think it's a great idea for other people. And you know, obviously, the the advantages are when you do have a partner, you can you increase production, you but you decrease the overhead because you share that, and so that also can help make make money obviously you also have different specialties sometimes combining with each other like pedo ortho which can, which can be very successful uh, but really a, a partnership and its success i think really depends on the partners themselves and the personalities and the relationships a lot of people have a, a misconception that partnerships fail because of money and i don't see that quite as often i see partnerships fail because the personalities conflict and so i often recommend personality testing going into uh, a partnership to begin with and also having very good legal documents um, to outline the relationship between the parties moving forward because you, you got to get into the deal you have to operate through the deal and you have to get out of the deal there's three key phases and if you don't thoroughly govern all three of those phases in the contracts, there could be issues. Now, granted, the best partnerships ever are those where people don't even pick up the contract ever again. They, they sign it, never pick it up because the, the, the relationship is so solid, there's no need to. The people understand each other. But if you have to go back to that contract, God forbid, then it's important to have everything thoroughly outlined. How you're gonna split the money, how you're gonna split the cost, management decision making and then how you get out of the deal like death disability disagreement uh, retirement default it's really important to have a good agreement in place but it can be successful if the relationships are right um, but some people are just not wired or made for partnerships and that's okay i, I think it, it works for some and not for others you said there were three parts of that contract 
three parts, three phases of a partnership, which is getting into the deal, which often consists of either uh, one person buying into the other person's practice. It can be a merger where doctors decide they're gonna merge their practices. Um, and it can just be a startup of doctors together. Now, startups have a little bit more of a failure rate in, in my personal um, uh, experience because oftentimes those partners haven't worked together before. Maybe they don't undergo the personality testing, et cetera. But those are the three main ways to get in. Most often I see getting in being through a purchase, such as an associate buying in to the practice that they're working in. And then once you get through phase one of getting into the deal, you then get to phase two, which is operation through the deal. And operation through the deal mainly consists of how everyone's splitting the money and the costs, how management decisions are being made, and transfer of interest. Um, are there restrictions on whether a party can transfer their interest or not? And there are di many different ways to do that. And then getting out of the deal is critical and it's probably the most non-governed area or non-thoroughly governed area that there is. And that's the most important because everybody gets out of a deal. They either retire or they, God forbid, die or God forbid, become disabled or God forbid, have a disagreement with their partner or God forbid, uh, have a default. Now, of course, four out of those fives, 80 percent of those are God forbid that you would never want to get involved with. But um, <laughs> but, you know, the retire. But you have to govern those areas because everybody gets out of a deal. So, uh, yeah, those are the three phases. And, and I, obviously I, I do lectures and I go into more detail on that, but I also don't want to have a, a you know, do an entire legal, you know, uh, uh, thesis right now. So I'll keep I it. will do the thesis. You're, you're, uh, I, I listen to you all day long. So I'm, my, my job is to guess the questions, right? So I, I've been on dental town every day since 1998, the young kids, some of the things, um, they're always talking about is, uh, so I, I come work for you. I come work for David Cohen and you're paying me 25% and you're doing a half million dollars a year. I work for you for three or four years, build this thing up for a million. And then when he goes to sell it to me, now he's saying it's worth a million dollars. It's like, dude, it was worth 500,000 when you hired me. So it's kind of like they, they, go, they graduate from school, they go in the kitchen, they make this big old pie and then they have to pay for it. Agree or disagree? I, I agree to a degree. I, I think there's arguments on both sides. The established doctor is going to argue that anybody can come in and do dental work, but the business is based on getting business and getting out in the community, having relationships, having goodwill and bringing in the business. So even though a doctor may come in as an associate and contribute to the value of the practice because they're producing, they are hired and they are paid to produce. They're paid the 25% and that's their job is to produce, but that's something that they could get somebody else in there to also do. Um, bringing in the business is where the business is. That's what the established doctor that would be selling would argue. Um, now on the flip side of that, if the younger doctor that's buying in is actually out marketing and helping bring in patients, they may have a better argument to say, well, they have contributed to the, um, you know, the appreciation and value of the practice. Sell, you know, the seller may argue in that instance, well, a lot of that was based upon the goodwill that I have of my practice that has allowed you to go out and build, you know, with a good name and get and help market. And again, I've been paying you to market. So it is a delicate territory. Um, I think there's arguments to be made on both sides. But I, I will say that I don't think it is as cut and dried for the younger docs to simply say, well, the practice is now worth more because I've been producing um, because there's a lot more that goes into it. And when I do lecture at the schools, I, I do speak on that uh, because I think it's important that the people coming out of school have a realistic view of what they're getting into. So again, not to say that their work and, and contributions don't contribute to that. And there can be, you know, great dental CPAs are out there that can help create formulas to find what's fair, but there are certainly both sides of, of the coin there. Um, so podcasting is killing radio. Almost everyone that emails me, Howard at dentaltown.com tells me, they all say the same thing. 85% of the time it's their commute to work, it's an hour long, or um, they're on a treadmill. And, um, they're, um, when you're talking to these kids, 
if, if I'm working for um, an old man right now, and I've been working there a year, and he's telling me that the, the plan is, you know, when I retire, I'm selling it to you. At what point in that relationship should they call you and start getting some type of legal advice, even though it might be uh, two or three years away? The typical case is, you know, he's, he's somewhere between 58 and 62, and they always say they're going to retire at 65. So from my standpoint, I can't speak for others, but from my standpoint, I became an attorney to help people and I had to have no issues. I, I when, when people come out of school or they're younger, or they've been working in the field for a bit and have a plan to potentially buy something and do something in a couple of years and endeavor. Uh, I, it's never too early to start talking. Um, really, the work comes in when the legal documents are produced for a lawyer. Um, to say, okay, now we're going to review a letter of intent, or now we're going to review purchase documents and partnership agreements. But it's really new, never too early for um, for me to chat with someone and just bounce ideas off of them and tell them what options may be out there. Um, so uh, it's never too early would be the answer for me. Okay, so I, uh, this is dentistry uncensored, so I get more brutal. How much would it cost her to call you? You say it's never too great early to question. talk. A lot of people are afraid to talk to a lawyer. Yeah, great question. And what I alluded to when I was saying uh, I did this to help people, I don't charge um, people to call me and have a, a, a conversation, a brief conversation that says, here's who I am, introduce themselves, and let's talk for a few minutes about what your plans are. And then, you know, here's how you, you may be able to do something or this may be a good idea for you in your circumstance. Let's let's continue to chat about this down the road. Uh, and then if it's a good fit, then certainly we can start chatting. And and if we're getting into some work, then I would charge some legal fees. But um, initially, I'm here to help and be a resource. And I don't typically charge people to just give a, a chat before we get going on things. So, um if you're on, uh, they're, they're driving, so I'm trying to be sympathetic driving, you know, to some number notes. So a lot of people just follow me on Twitter at Howard Fran. So I'm uh, on Twitter. David Cohen is uh, at D Cohen Law Firm, and I just retweeted his last tweet. Um, Happy first day of autumn. Time to get back to business. Starting a new dental practice. Let's talk. Copen Law Firm. So I just retweeted that. If you want to get to work and uh, find the contact there. But I'm on your website right now, Cohen Law Firm, PLLC. What's the PLLC stand for? Professional Liability Corporation? Uh, close. Professional Limited Liability Company. Okay, what do my homies find if they go to Cohen Law Firm, PLLC? Professional Limited Liability Corporation. Cohen Law Firm, PLLC. What are my homies going to find there? Um, is that a good way? I see your phone number. You got a phone number for Dallas in Seattle. So I see you're kind of fighting internally be between being a Seahawks fan or a Dallas Cowboy fan. You're just <laughs> you're trying to find yourself. Which 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 NFL right. team do you well, worship? Well, I, I worship the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, you know, that's where I'm originally from. And so, um, you know, I, as you mentioned, have an office up there and continue ties up there. So definitely a Seattle Seahawks fan. Um but I do love sports, and I love checking out the the, the, the Dallas scene as well. Well, you're uh, you're six foot four and played basketball in college, so you're probably a Dallas Mavericks fan. And and uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, um, who's the owner of the map? Um, Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban. Is he your idol? Since you played college basketball, did you uh, try to? Yeah. Are you trying to talk to him to let him let you play for the Mavericks? No. I, I, the glory days are over for me. Too many broken bones, but um, I, I love basketball. I have tickets to the Maverick games and enjoy going. They're not, I, I wouldn't clarify them as my team. Seattle was always my team, and I'm still holding out that hope they get a team back up there. I know people are working hard in the Northwest to try to get a team up there, uh, but I, I love the game, and I love, uh, love attending games. You know what I've... Uh, um... I love Mark Cuban because I wish dentists would watch Shark Tank because I, I get dentistry. I totally get it. I mean, extracting a wisdom tooth, uh, doing doing dentistry is so fun, and they just don't want to do the business. That's not. They didn't go to business school. They didn't go to law school. They went to dental school. They want to be a surgeon. They want to work with their hands on people. But, you know, like like um, Cuban on Shark Tank, first question he'd ask is, uh, 
what, what, what is your new customer acquisition cost? What, what's it cost you to find a new customer? I mean, almost every question they ask in Shark Tank, a dentist would just look at you like a deer in a headlight, and it's like, I just wish dentists, in fact, someone needs to write an article of the most common questions asked on Shark Tank that every dentist should answer. And one of, one of the things Cubans always say, what, what are you going to do with the money? And these kids are saying, well, Howard, if I buy, if, if I buy a, should I do a de novo practice or should I start one up? And then if I do a de novo, since I'm going to practice in the same place from age 25 to 65, 40 years, wouldn't I be a fool to pay rent? So, so if I'm going to do a de novo, should I do land building, start a practice? So I know that's like five questions at once, but I'm sure you're a lawyer, so you can remember them all. Um, so de novo or buy? And even if even if it's de novo or buying, do I want to buy the real estate? I mean, some people say I, I don't want the real estate. What, what, what's your thoughts on all those questions? See, well, my I, questions I, are so horrible. I asked like ten, <laughs> so maybe one of them was good enough that you'll bite on it. No worries. Uh, I, I'm happy to answer them, the ones that I can remember. And if I didn't, you can obviously <laughs> prompt me. Uh, so there is a dilemma with doctors as to whether to start a de novo or or buy a practice and. I've seen some really successful situations where doctors will buy a practice in say the two, three hundred thousand dollar range, where it is essentially a de novo. Uh, there are issues with the practice, so to speak, or maybe there isn't a whole lot of goodwill, but they're able to still have some equipment, which may be good, or or, or they're able to have some goodwill and some patient flow that's already there, where they can't they can't do a startup for less than three hundred thousand dollars usually. So. You know, you can get a practice that has a lot of promise that you buy low, would ultimately sell high, and, and, and you buy that practice, and now you've already got patients and you have some other things in place. That can be a really sweet spot, an ideal situation, um, obviously depending on the geography. A de novo is great as well. Obviously, the biggest issue is building goodwill in the community to get patients in there. And so it's really important to understand where you're doing that and whether it's a, a good situation and good place to get a lot of new patient flow. I just had um, a conversation with somebody who was looking to potentially do a startup in the Frisco area of Texas. And according to them in the Frisco area of Texas, there is just so much concentration. It was going to be difficult in their mind to do a, a startup because because of getting the patients in there and all the other options that were immediately surrounding them. So I think whether to do the startup or whether to do the purchase oftentimes depends on uh, the goodwill and your ability to, to get patients in there. As far as the real estate is concerned, um, like you said, if someone's going to own you know, this practice for a significant amount of time, if, if the deal is right and they can buy the building, I think that's a great idea. Um, Oftentimes, banks will only lend so much. Sometimes they won't lend enough for a doctor, particularly someone right out of school, to do the building and the practice both at the same time. And sometimes they will. You know, a lot of factors come into that, the person's credit, all that kind of stuff. So um, I guess to summarize everything in the most lawyerly way that I unintentionally did this, but it depends on the circumstance. And that's your typical lawyer answer, but I, I really think it's true. And, but I, I do find that people are finding a niche in these practices they can buy for maybe 100, 200,000, where it's less than even a startup, and yet they still have some patient flow and they have a start, and then they can, if they have their, feel like there's a lot of potential, then they, they can grow it significantly. An, an immediate stress that uh, I get emailed uh fairly regular and I see on dental town is uh, let's say I want to go to Frisco uh, because I wasn't smart enough to go to San Francisco. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but let's, <laughs> where, where is Frisco by the way? Is that a suburb of Dallas? Frisco. Yeah. It's about 30 minutes North of Dallas. Okay. So let's say that I was born and raised in Frisco and I really want to live there. When I came out of school, um, I, um, I look for a job in Frisco. And so I find this nice guy named David Cohen, and I want to work for him. And then all of a sudden, he slides out a piece of paper, says, you work for me, you got to sign a non-compete clause. And if you ever leave my practice, you can't work within, you know, you can't work in Frisco, or you can't work within five miles of my practice for two years. What, what, do, what, do, you, what do you say? Do those hold up in court? Um, 
should you have a lawyer look at those before you sign that? Um, I know it's, I know that the, it's, it's the, the, the boundary is totally different in a real rural area versus downtown Manhattan where you might have 10,000 people living on every city block. Well, what would you say to her if she's stressed out because this, she's trying to get a job and they want her to sign a non-compete clause? So the first thing that I would say is yes, absolutely the document should be reviewed by legal counsel because not only does it govern the non-compete, but it also governs other restrictive areas such as you know protection of intellectual property, confidentiality. There's often contracts that are drafted um, that say that any you know works made by that or, or inventions or discoveries by a doctor during the course of their employment belong to the employer. And so it's important to review that. Also, all the material terms of the deal, the schedule, the schedule is critical because when you speak of non-compete, if they're only getting three days a week, they probably need to work somewhere else. And so if they're restricted, that can be a, a really big problem. Um, so parts of the contract link to others. So schedule is critical. Um, the pay, uh, being clear about the pay and, and, and knowing, um, you know, if it's based on collections, what that actually consists of and when that will be paid, particularly when a contract terminates, um, you know, do you, does the associate still get their collections after termination in connection with work they did prior to the, the, the contract terminating? A lot of the corporate dental groups out there will have clauses in their contract that say, no, once you stop, you stop. So uh, it's important to have reviewed for those reasons. But going back to the non-compete, which was your original question, um, the non-compete does differ from state to state. Every state has their own standard on non-competes. And in most states, non-competes are enforceable as long as the parameters of the non-compete comply with the law. And in most states, there's a reasonability standard that says the parameters have to be the smallest that can legitimately protect the employer without prejudice to the employee. And obviously in English, that just has to be reasonable based upon the circumstances. So in your example, one mile in New York City can be significant, whereas one mile in rural um, you know, Arizona could be uh, nothing. So it does depend on the circumstance. And then you do have some states where that are very tough on non-competes and, and do have exceptions, such as if someone sells goodwill in a practice, Oftentimes in those tough states, non-competes can be enforceable, but for an associateship, oftentimes they're not at all. Um, certain states like California and Colorado, just as examples, are very difficult on non-competes for associates. And that's because strength, uh, states just don't like restraint on trade. They don't like saying so-and-so, you can't go make a living somewhere. So the non-compete does vary from state to state. Um, my recommendation often, if you're in a state where non-competes are enforceable for an associate, let's say it's in Frisco, that they grew up there, they wanna be there, is to perhaps have a clause that says for the first three months, four months, if things don't work out, the non-compete is not applicable because I won't build up enough goodwill in your practice to hurt you, yet if you fire me on day two, then, and I didn't build up any goodwill here, I have all these restrictions. And so um, that's one solution for people, but non-competes can be enforceable and they, they um, it, it just depends on whether they meet the parameters of what the law says in the state that they're in. Um, I get this question a lot where they say, uh, I really want to get a job. You know, I got $350,000 of student loans. Um, um, they, uh, they're upset with their parents for them not being rich and paying for their dental school. And uh, so now they got student loans, they can't sue their parents for being poor. And uh, they really want this job at corporate. And they say, here's here's the employee agreement, sign it. And they say, well, should I have this review that? And they go, dude, we, we have 50 offices, there's no negotiation, sign that. Is, that. is that generally true? Because I get conflicting deals. I see um, headhunters emailing me all the time saying they'll, they'll pay me $2,000 if I find a dentist that will go to any one of these 10 locations. Um, the classified ads on Dentaltown have exploded. In fact, uh, on, your, on the um, Dentaltown app, the next update is gonna put the classifieds on the, on the iPhone and the smartphone because, I mean, we, we have like 6,000 ads and the ads are like, half of them are like people looking for an associate, 
half of them are, you know, I'm looking for a job. And then you got all the practices for sale. So, so I kind of call it bullshit that this contract's non-negotiable. The whole thing's non-negotiable, yet you're paying people $2,000 for a finder's fee to find a dentist. Um, what, what are you seeing in the real world? Well, you know, it, like you mentioned, a lot of the corporate contracts are not as negotiable because, and in those circumstances, that's because they have 10, 20, 30 people lined up. And if you don't want to take it too bad, they'll go on to the next. Other contracts are negotiable. Um, it, really, negotiability is based upon leverage. And if it's a practice that really wants you, then you're gonna have more leverage than if they say, I got 30 different people lined up and if it ain't you, it's gonna be the next person, we don't really care, right? So I, I think that the corp, but I do find that the more corporate uh, groups do negotiate much less and maybe because they don't wanna set up a slippery slope where if they make an exception for one person then they have to do it for others. Um, I, I don't know the rationale, it depends on the group. But uh, I do think it's true in some circumstances that associates are handed agreements and that say sign this or not. And associates have to be very careful when they see those agreements because there can be things as egregious as massive penalties if you want to voluntarily get out of the deal. Um, there could be massive restrictions on non-competes, which could be uh, encompassing mileage from every location that these corporate groups have, even those that the associate doesn't work at, which is completely unreasonable. And in, in most of the time, in most states, they wouldn't even be enforceable. But the problem with enforceability is there's a legal reality and then there's a practical reality. And the legal reality is the parameters may not be enforceable, but the practical reality is if an associate violates it, that employer is probably going to come after them. And if they come after them, right or wrong, that associate who is probably has debt coming out of school, et cetera, they're not going to, you know, it's, it's not in their best interest to hire an attorney to pay a bunch of fees to defend that, uh, those claims that are being brought by the employer. So um, realistically, from a practical standpoint, it, you want to make sure that you get those documents reviewed and know what you're getting into. And if you do decide that you just have to sign on, to one of these agreements, the money's too good, it helps you pay off the debt, then there are strings attached that come with it. And oftentimes those could be penalties, you know, egregious non-competes, et cetera. So but, do, 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 does your law firm um, actively find the practices and list them or do, do these, or, are you independent of that? I mean, are you, are you like promoting practices for sale and market and advertise those or? No, my law firm does not perform brokerage services. We're strictly a law firm. So we help doctors that ha are locating a practice. We help them buy that practice for, you know, with the documents to effectuate that, that purchase or seller. So, so a sell practice practice. broker is completely different than the uh, legal law firm. Correct. We, exactly. There are some brokers that happen to be attorneys. But uh, we are strictly a law firm. Um, like I mentioned to you, we do not do dual representation, um, mostly in all cases. We strictly perform legal work for people that are entering into transactions. And what is a, what is a typical practice broker's commission? Like, like if you sell a house, I mean, in Phoenix, I mean, the typical commission is what, 7% or what, what is a typical real estate agent's commission versus a practice broker's commission? I typically see in real estate about a 6% commission, which is often typically split between buyer's uh, broker and seller's broker, 3% each. Uh, that's kind of the traditional model. But in, in practice sales, usually the, there's a broker on the seller side. There's not typically a broker on the buyer side. There can be, but it's pretty rare that I see brokers on both sides. It's, and the broker fee is typically paid by the seller. There are some groups out there that do try to do dual representation and and will um, take a fee from both sides. To me, that's a conflict of interest. Um, as long as that's legally disclosed and the client's okay with that, then that's something they can move forward with. Otherwise, um, it's a problem if it's not legally disclosed. It is a conflict of interest. But um, those brokers typically charge, I've seen between anywhere between five and 10% of the sale price. 
and that is charged to the seller client. Uh, but th that's the range of fees that I'm typically seeing when I see broker fees. And I mean, you're a very well connected man. You've been doing this a long time. Right now, today, is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? Where's the where's the supply and demand curve right now? I mostly see this as a seller's market. Obviously, there are exceptions. Every area of the country is different. Geographies, and you know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, it may be tougher to sell a practice. Um, and it could be a buyer's market, but for the most part, I'm seeing this as a seller's market. In fact, in, in, in uh, yeah, I, we have clients all over the country and um, we do you know, transactions all over the country. And when we do, in most of the more uh, metropolitan areas, if a buyer isn't quick to accept terms on a letter of intent, a lot of times it's gone because it, it is a seller's market. There's a lot of demand and, and the seller takes the best offer and runs. And in real estate right now, I don't know the Dallas market, um, but um, you know, um, you know, a three-bedroom, two-house is the middle market, and you list those in Phoenix, they're gone in a day. Whereas once you get over a million dollars, you kind of got an illiquid asset, and every home in Phoenix that's over a million dollars, uh, and can, a lot of them can sit there for years. What is the what is the three-bedroom, two-bath house in a dental practice? Uh, in the sweet spot. And what is so big, it's kind of an illiquid asset? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, oh, I think that question oftentimes depends on the threshold of what banks are willing to loan. I find that doctor, it's not impossible, but I'm finding that doctors are have a more of a difficult time getting loans for practices that are you know, in excess of 1.5 million or even even over the one million dollar range. So um, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It's just banks and their risk management often are, you know, it's more difficult for them to get to loan. So if it's more difficult to get the money over those monetary thresholds, then obviously it's going to be difficult, more difficult for a seller to sell. And actually, I've seen a lot of my clients uh, are in the you know top 10, top five percentile. A lot of them have had issues with with potential with selling because their practice has a high value. And those often look to the, the venture capital groups and, 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 the, and the corporate groups to sell to because those often are the ones that have the capacity to 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 make those purchases. I, I agree. Every everybody I know that was over two million, like two to four million, the only person they could sell to was Heartland. I mean Rick Rick Workman come in write you a check today at lunch while you're eating a Subway sandwich, but going after that graduation class with a two to four million dollar practice not really gonna happen. I wanna ask you the same question, um, as far as liquidity. Um Rural versus urban. Uh, sometimes you hear stories. I mean, I have heard stories, maybe one uh, a year for the last you know thirty years, where some guys out in the middle of nowhere, nowhere, Arkansas, you know, New Mexico, Arizona, a town of eight hundred, and after his, he listed it for three years. When I mean, he tried to, he retired at sixty five, and finally at sixty eight, he had no buyers and he had no health, and he just shut the doors and went home. Uh, do you do uh, how much more illiquid are rural practices than downtown Dallas, Phoenix, Seattle? I don't know the direct answer to that question. I do know that the rural practices can be very successful. Um, I think what I've found with the rural practices is it's more difficult to find somebody that wants to work in those practices. Uh, but if you can find someone that will work in those practices or if you can bring on a partner, I have clients that have decided they are going to expand. We talked at the beginning of this interview about certain uh, people that have a practice, but they want to buy additional locations. Well, one, one thing that I'm seeing is doctors that will have a practice and they'll bring in a partner to add a location that is willing to work at the location. And there's there's less volatility because they're an actual partner, they're an owner. So they're gonna they're gonna be there. And so and, and so the rural practice can actually be pretty successful because if you have someone that wants to be there and they're locked into being there and they're committed, you often have a really large community to pull from from 
you know, even 50 miles out because there aren't that many practices that all could come to see you. So I've seen that side of it. And then I've also seen um, the rural practices that are less liquid that are, are not as successful as well. So and, and a lot of that has to do with geography. What um, this is May 23rd. So the dental schools are all graduating. And um, if, if they call. Who's going to find them? Who's going to pre-approve their credit? Is the practice broker going to do that, or do you do that? Can you hook them up with banks, or is that something the practice broker does? I have a lot of relationships with banks that I'm happy to provide contacts for, for people that have that have questions about that or want to connect with a bank. I'm always happy to provide recommendations, just like you, and, and being in, in the industry, we meet a lot of people, and we have a lot of relationships and it's always great to connect them with with relationships with great people um brokers can do that as well brokers are great at connecting people with banks so um i don't think there's a, a wrong answer there um you know they can come to me they can go to a, to a broker um a cpa consultant uh who has relationships and connecting but i do i will say this i do think it's important to connect with banks that do dental loans because the banks that don't sometimes don't understand loans. They don't understand that dental loans are incredibly low risk and incredibly successful um, if they understand the full scope of it. And so it, I do think it's important to connect with banks that do do dental loans and understand dental loans. So um, I'm not smart enough to ask you the questions because I'm a dentist. I, I'm, I'm doing dentistry. I, I never bought my practice. I, I, I did a de novo. Um, I'm not interested in selling the practice. My, I'm going to have my uh, practice sold uh, after the funeral. That's my exit strategy. Uh, okay. you know. did, well, did you see that today? I posted on uh, social media in Dentaltown. Um, it was in Evansville, Indiana. They did a newspaper story on who they think is the oldest practicing dentist in the United States. He's 93. And I knew another guy, George Rui, uh, in uh, St. Joe, Missouri, practically was 92. And I can't make this up. I was lecturing in L.A. and a 91-year-old dentist came to my lecture, and he's the only um, dentist who's a Holocaust survivor. He's from Auschwitz, and he was so excited. At 90 years old, he decided to upgrade his two-degree, two-dimensional pano to a three-dimensional CBCT, and he's already placed like nine implants. And he was talking about it so fast, I thought he was going to hyperventilate. I'm like. Dude, you're you're 90 years old and you sunk your first implant. He's like, hell yeah! And I said, uh, <laughs> so someone, you need to write a book from Auschwitz to placing implants. Uh, right. so, so I'm not interested. But so in your world, what questions am I not smart enough to ask? What What do you think that the the sellers, what are their common top mistakes or where they come to you and they they realize that's not what they do for a living? And then the buyer. So so. Ask yourself your own question, since I'm really not in your space, I'm not in your market. Where, where are the sellers um, not thinking right and need to think about, and then the buyers, what are they not thinking of that they need to think about? So unequivocally, the first thing that both buyers and sellers make mistakes on is not forming a team, uh, thinking they can do things themselves. And there are two main reasons why it's not a good idea to not form a team and to do it yourself. Number one, a doctor typically doesn't have the, the requisite expertise in an area to do things themselves. Uh, and number two, even if they have the requisite expertise, they don't have the time. They have to practice dentistry, they have to run a practice. And so it's really important to surround themselves with a team. And that team can consist of a lawyer to review or draft contracts, an accountant that can help with the numbers, uh, consultants, bankers, insurance agents, Form a team. That doesn't mean they have to hire a team of employees to do this. These are outsourced people that are there to help them with their team to make the right decisions. Um, but then delving deeper into it, once they find a team, sellers, their biggest mistake, in my opinion, that are selling partnership interest is not getting the personality testing uh, that I talked about earlier and making sure that it's a good fit. Um, because it's, again, I think the biggest issue with, with partnerships failing is the fact that they 
the relationship crumbles. So, so, so how do you, how do you get a personality test? I mean, I mean, is there one specific one you recommend? There are sources out there that do personality testing. Um, I have a, a couple that I can recommend. I, I don't have them in front of me, but I, there are a couple recommendations that I can provide um, to do those personality tests. They're not necessarily the cheapest. They can be a couple grand, but it's definitely worth. So in it's my not an opinion. online test. I don't think no. I don't think it's an online test. I think it's a pretty extensive process to make sure that the personalities do mesh. You know, I've had it's not one hundred percent right, but uh, it's right most of the time. What percent so, of the dentists uh, take the test and find out that they don't have a personality? Um. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but, uh, but uh, that they don't have a personality. That they don't have a personality. Probably, probably you know, 99% of them. No, I'm just kidding. Well, um, it, it, they, they are a different bunch because of natural selection. I mean, you, you can't get into dental school, med school, or law school unless you sat in a library while everyone else was in a frat, dating, having fun, going to parties. And, I mean, when when I was, you know, at Creighton, I mean, it was the same people in the libraries, all the pre-med, pre debt pre-law and then when you went back to the dorm, all the communications majors and business majors were drunk. You know, I mean, that was just right, right. I mean, I, I, I don't think I ever saw a business major study uh, at Creighton like like a pre dental, pre med, pre law. So you're getting you're getting a bunch of intense people that got A's in calculus and physics and geometry. And they're just they're just intense people. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's an intensity there, but I think I think the personalities have to mesh. If someone's more intense, oftentimes opposites attract, and and you know, the partners feed off each other and their personalities. Oftentimes, when you have two really strong personalities that clash, it, it doesn't always work out in the, in the best way, but um, it can. But that's why it's important to get that testing, so to make sure that. Um, that, that you optimize your chance of success. So, I, I mean, the biggest mistake that I see is that from a selling doctor um, and not forming a team as well. Uh, if they're just gonna sell their practice in totality and not bring in a partner, uh, I, you know, again, I would say the biggest mistake is not hiring a team. A lot of these sellers just have a broker representing them, which, and brokers are great and brokers have purpose, but they're not attorneys and they will profess to not be attorneys. And I do think it's important that a seller get an attorney. I can't tell you how many deals I'm on where sellers don't have an attorney to accompany their broker. So uh, I, I do think that's important. And from a buyer's perspective, I also think it's important to have counsel um, on their end to make sure that they are doing things the proper way. Um, oftentimes they will wanna save some money because maybe they're right out of school but um, you know, a bad decision can take somebody back years. It, it can take years to recover um, if you make a mistake. So it's really important, I think, to surround yourself with a team, have an attorney review documents, have a CPA on your side. Uh, and, and I think those are probably the biggest mistakes. So accountant. Um, you, you, real so quick, I just want to intervene. For whatever reason, the plug on my computer is not working and it's about to die. I'm going to grab a different charger, plug it in for 30 seconds. I apologize. I'm going to run. Wanna do, you want to do it now? Yeah, I'm just going to run and grab it. Yeah, 30 yeah no, no worries, buddy. I think we're set now. We're good to go. So, you know, uh, it was Alan, uh, who I forgot the economist, wasn't Alan Greenspan, but they were talking about irrational exuberance. Uh, is there uh, any uh, irrational exuberance on the side of the buyers and sellers? I mean, do sellers think they're going to get more money than they do? Do buyers think they're going to get it for less price? What, 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 are the, what are irrational expectations from the buyer side versus the seller sides that you have to deal with that talking about it could educate my homies? All right. Well, I think I think the the sellers there's a lot of emotion with the seller because oftentimes the seller has operated their practice for a significant amount of time, 20, 30, 40 years, and they put their heart and soul into it. And so obviously they may place a higher value on the practice than uh, maybe a, a valuation says. And then buyers also may. Uh, obviously think the opposite. You mentioned a great example earlier of a buyer who maybe was an associate in the practice and wants to claim that they added to the increase in value of the practice. 
and so the practice valuation should be lesser. I, I've heard a saying by people that say that if the buyer's not happy and the seller's not happy with the valuation, then they probably nailed it because it, it, it's uh, you know down the middle somewhere of where they both accepted. Uh, if somebody, if one party's ecstatic and the other isn't, usually one party's getting screwed. Obviously, there's a huge generality; it's not always the case. But uh, but I do think that there is some delusion with that. And and also, w when I lecture at the schools, I, I also find that they're being told the, the doctors are being told that they should have some sort of entitlement to ownership right when they come out of school in some of these practices, or they associate and they be and they should automatically be guaranteed the offer to buy in at some point. And I think that's completely delusional because people right out of school that are going into a practice, how do they know that that's somewhere that they want to be? And how does the seller know that that's someone they want to be with if it's a partnership or carry on their legacy if they're selling the whole practice? So um, I know that people that are coming right out of school have an expectation that they, they want to own and they're entrepreneurial and that's great. But it's also important for them to understand that it's okay to not be guaranteed before your first day of work in an office even starts that you're going to be able to buy that office. So um, those are the things that I see that I think need to be more realistic. Well, when, when you're in those schools, tell, tell me what you're sensing because, um, you know, 30 years, I graduated 30 years ago this month. This is today's May 23rd. I graduated May 11, 30 years ago. And I know what you're thinking. I only look like I'm 28 but I'm actually 54 and a grandpa. Um, but, the, you know, they, they told all the girls in our class that they were only going to practice five or six years, get married, have babies, blah, 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 blah. And 30 years later, all them girls are still working. And um, and those girls had monster practice. I mean, when I look at the, the only practices that were like one and a half million or higher, it was almost all the girls did that. Now I'm hearing more girl... Um, I don't know what you call it, uh, uh, comments, sexism, where they saying that, you know, they just want to be a soccer mom. These, these girls want to go work at corporate. They don't want to be their own boss. They, they just want to leave at 5 o'clock and not worry about the business. And they just want to go home and, and be a soccer mom. Is that what you're reading? I mean, what percent of, when you're in these dental school classes, what percent of them kids are telling you, no, I, I want to own my own place someday, versus how many are telling you, no, I do not want to. I don't know business, don't like business. I just want to be an employee the rest of my life. What, what, what are you feeling in the dental schools? I'm feeling the majority of the people that I talk to want to own, that they're, uh, the millennial generation is very entrepreneurial, very business-minded, and that they want to have ownership. And um, so th that's the sentiment that I get. Obviously, there are exceptions to that, uh, but that, that's what I'm finding. But you know, some of these corporate models are actually really good for some, for a certain type of person because they can often associate for one of these corporate groups and then buy in with one of these corporate groups, but um, still have the management be performed by that corporate group so that they have the ownership. They're maybe paid more than they would than they were an employee, but they don't have to deal with the management side of the practice. And I actually had a client recently who wanted to do some things at home and be with her family and it was an actual perfect model for her because she could be an owner but she didn't have to do all the things that came with ownership for some people that is not the, the a great model because they want to partake in that management they want to control their own destiny and they want to run the practice so um but, but what, I, percent, what, what percent are you seeing now what percent say i just want to be an employee what percent say i want to own someday I don't know exactly if I had to estimate based upon my experience, I would say that, um, you know, 80% of the people that I come across want to own. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, uh, you were born and raised in Seattle, right? Correct. And Jeff Bezos had the best talk ever. He said, you know, he says, nobody can predict the future. So don't try to, but look back at the history of man for the last 2 million years and focus on what's not going to change. Homo sapien doesn't want to share a cave with you. They don't like anybody controlling them. They don't like to be under anyone's thumb. That shit's never going to go away. Uh, when they go into college, they want their own dorm room. Even if they move, here's why I'm against, here's another reason I'm against partnerships. Not only have I seen a gazillion of them fail, but remember in college, 
there'd be like two guys that were like best friends in the gym or on the basketball court and say, hey, let's room the room together. What what is the fastest way to destroy a friendship in college? <laughs> Don't room with your best friend. I told all four of my boys. If you go to college, just do me a favor. Please don't room with your best friend. Because uh-huh. he's your best friend because you've never lived with him. You don't know what he does with his towels and his clothes. And, you know, I mean, he could be, you know, the biggest disaster. Um, and that's why you're probably saying that that personality test is huge. But I don't think Homo sapien changed or evolved in the last 30 years. And you keep hearing all these things, how different millennials aren't. Millennials aren't any different. They're, they got the same chromosomes as their mom and dad. And that animal behavior of, I want my own farm, I ain't listening to you, I don't like, look at Americans, they hate checks and balances, they hate big government, they hate anyone telling them what to do, but supposedly this person who was so ambitious, they went through eight years of college, now they just want to be an employee. I call bullshit on that from the word go. And the other thing I call bullshit on is they say that they want to be a soccer mom. They just want to leave a five and forget the place. You know what a real soccer mom is? A real soccer mom is when you get a call from school that says your son just fell off the swing set and busted open his face. She just tells the staff, cancel all my patients and grabs her car keys and leaves. She's not, she don't want to ask the office manager or the regional director. She, that's just not how she rolls. I mean, uh, so, so I, 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 don't think, I don't think a millennial is going to be any different than their great-grandparents on all the fundamental stuff that matters, you know? So that was a uh, um, long rant. So uh, um, you've been so generous with your time. Are there, are there any other issues you want to talk about? Any, and, and by the way, on that personality test, um, they're, they're driving to work. There's, uh, there's 50 categories on Dentaltown. There's a quarter million dentists on Dentaltown. 50,000 of them have the app. Um, there's... Um, 50 categories. I'm trying to think where you should post this. Um, a very active thread is um, uh, practice transitions. And under practice transitions, uh, the subgroups are associates corner, future planning, general discussions, partnerships and associates, practice acquisitions, practice sales, practice startups, retirement planning, retired and soon to be retired. Dentist. I wish you would, could you start a post with any of the uh the things we're talking about because she's driving right now um like that personality test or in any leads or notes uh, uh i know you you've been a, a townie for a long time but you've you've never made a post yet this would be your your virgin post <laughs> and, and then after that post i'll post the uh the podcast and, and, and if you feel like you're embarrassed because you feel like you're promoting yourself just say i just did a podcast howard and he made me do it he he wants me to post <laughs> but, but because she's driving to work and the first thing, you know, you know, the first thing I was thinking about on that personal test, number one, you don't, you don't um, know who you're dealing with. I mean, when you're buying a practice, they could be insane. And what's even more scary talking about personal test is a lot of these about one third of the class has a dentist in the uh, um, family, mom, dad, uncle or whatever. And a lot of them are going back with a family member. And that kind of makes it weird and creepy because how how do you go tell your dad, you know, uh, I mean, how, how, do, how do you talk to him straight when you got to sit across the table with him at Sunday dinner or Thanksgiving or, you know, what, what do you recommend on that? About, I'm sorry, can you? Well, I mean, do, do you still, I mean, do you, are, do you really think she should tell dad, dad, I want you to take a personality test? Oh, right, right. Well, it, it, it often is not well received. And I know that there are circumstances where it has not been well received. And the mentality there has been, well, maybe the person who, who wanted to propel the other person to have the personality test um, learned everything they needed to know by simply asking if the other would be willing to do that. Because if the other person would not be willing to, that may tell them, well, this really may not be somebody that I want to work with if they're not on the same page as me because this isn't a one-way street. It's not just me figuring out if I should be working with you. It's you figuring out, too, if you should be working with me. And so if they're not amenable to doing that, it might tell that other person something. So they may get their answer right there without having to spend the money for the test. So what, what if she's 25 and she has her old man take the test and comes back and says, you have a borderline personality disorder with a touch of histrionic narcissism? 
<laughs> well, I, I think, you know, when, when you have family situations, I, again, the personality tests are not 100% accurate. And, and there, there are people that are out there that have not been compatible through those tests that have still had success by working together. So it's not the only thing to look at. It's just something that should be in the arsenal. Where, where, where I've seated an issue is not the first five years, not the first seven, but let's say 10 or 15 years later, and um, one guy starts going to uh, Panky, Koi, Spear, joins the Seattle Study Club and wants to do this, drop all the PPOs and buy a CBCT and, and Serac and do all this high-end stuff. And the other person's more infatuated with Ikea, Southwest Airlines, Walmart, Costco, the big market says, no, we're 80% PPOs and, and, and we're going that, you know what I mean? A direction of, and, and it's cool if, if two dentists, if one says, well, I want to place implants, the other one says, okay, I don't, well, that's cool. And then I want to place Invisalign and the other guy doesn't. So when the associates expand the menu by doing different things, that's amazing. Um, but um, I, I, I've seen it, the, the problems, 10, 20 years later of um, wanting to do different uh, market segments of the same economy. Is that what you see or not? Yeah, I, I do see a lot of that as well. Yeah. Well, hey, that was the fastest hour I've ever done. Uh, I think you're an amazing man. Uh, you're in Dallas. Um, if you could drive over to uh, Mark Cuban's house and tell him I want to podcast him, and uh, tell, tell Mark Cuban, I want to, Ryan, we need to do that. We need to Google and find a, uh, um, the top questions asked on Shark Tank. Because uh, I just think that would be, because every time you watch Shark Tank, I'm just sitting here thinking, uh, if a dentist was standing there saying, hey, Mark Cuban, I want you to give me $750,000. I'm going to buy a dental practice. Great. And then couldn't answer any question that, you know, Mark Cuban's <laughs> going to say, Mr. Wonderful's going to say. They're all going to ask the same dozen i mean how many questions really are there there's not that many and um and it's uh it's tough because i love my homies i love dentistry uh but they didn't go to business school they didn't go to law school and i want to make one final comment before i uh let david go and that is uh um dentists seem to be kind of more of a know-it-all personality and like they'll, they'll go start a de novo and they'll go sign a, a three thousand square foot lease for 10 years and didn't have a professional read it and there's all this stuff, you know, uh, did you know that almost none of them read their PPO contract when they sign it? And then they find out that you sign this PPO, now they have the right to start enrolling you into Medicaid or Medicare or some other thing. And then to get out of it, they need a, a written certified letter. And then, and then, and then they, you're not out of it for like one year. I mean, they just, I mean, gosh darn it, you're a dentist. And, you know, when you graduate from dental school next week, they should say, congratulations, you're a doctor of dental surgery, and you don't know shit about anything else. And what you were talking about is get a team. You need lawyers. You need a good CPA. You need bankers. You need insurance agents. Develop that team. And uh, so how do my homies contact you? They go to cohenlawfirmplc.com. Um, can they email you? Yeah, I'd love to get emails. Um, my email address is david at... Cohen Law Firm, PLLC.com. So it's it's the website, which is Cohen Law Firm, PLLC.com. And it's just my name, David, at C O H. What, what do they want to call you? What do they want to call me? No, no, what if they want to call you? Oh, yeah. And then I was going to get to that. The phone number, 972 379 7513. So if you're in a public restroom right now, right on the wall, for a good time, Dial 972 <laughs> through. Right. Hey, David, the only reason this show is a success is because I'm able to get uh, amazing people on to come on the show like you. Thank you so much today for coming and talking to my homies. Oh, absolutely. And I want to express my gratitude to you for having me on the show. You're awesome. It was fun. And like you said, it was definitely the fastest hour uh, that I've done when I've done an interview. So I really appreciate that. Well, I that. want you to know, I want you to know, it, it was hard for me to interview you because being an Arizona Cardinals fan, I hate the Seahawks more than, right. more than just about anything on earth. That is the, uh, that is the one team, but, uh, my God, it's so, 
even when they have an amazing year, they still go up to Seattle and get their ass kicked. It's like well, it's like, if it makes you feel better, you 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 guys knocked Seattle out of the 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 first round by last year when you won in Seattle toward the end of the year there, and so Seattle had to go on the road and then they ended up losing at Atlanta. So maybe it would have been different for Seattle had they gotten the two seed in the first round by and. So, hey, you can at least hang your hat on, on, on knocking us out. And you've been to a recent Super Bowl, too, so you guys are still strong. So um, how, how do you think the te- Seattle team is going to be this year? I think they'll be solid. They got, they got great talent on both sides of the ball, and a lot of times you've got to have the ball bounce your way with the injury. One, the one <laughs> I'm waiting to see if he comes back is that Oakland Raiders quarterback who was just crushing it and then broke his leg at the end of the season. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Carr. But you think you think he'll be back on the field strong? Yeah, I think he should be. I think you know, with science and medical now, they're they're getting guys back and, and, and going. So he uh, he should be good. My heart hurt for him so bad. I know I mean, it was tough. It was that, tough. That's like climbing. Almost got to the top of Mount Everest and rolled all the way back down to base camp. I mean. Yeah, it was tough. It's the nature of the NFL, unfortunately. You know, any any play, something can happen. Yeah, anytime so. some Dennis is bitching about uh, how hard their job is, I always say, you know, go 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 be a, a, a coal miner. Go play for the NFL and have 300-pound men run right, up to you right, as right. fast as they can with a helmet on uh, when you yeah. compare it to other jobs. But uh, thanks a lot so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time.